So we're going to have a little bit of fun. I'm going to try to go through the slides relatively quickly so we can have a little bit of a discussion. There's going to be some biology, but really this is more about a social experiment. To give a little bit of background on myself, um, before I went to I'm finishing up um, at Harvard Med now, I did a PhD at Oxford Metabolism. I think like a lot of people here, I just love to read cells, science, and nature. I get really excited about biology, metabolism, whatever field of science you're in. But you want to find a way to communicate that awe to like a broader public. Or something I've really become interested in is like how to translate love and awe for my field to a broad audience. Um, so this was a stunt I pulled around January, where we're studying a topic that I'll get into, this, this phenotype around lipids and cholesterol. Sometimes people go low carb, the cholesterol goes to the roof, we'll go, by that, you know, go over why that is. But based on this model, I had a kind of bold hypothesis that I could do something like use Oreo cookies to lower my cholesterol. So, um, I was gonna ask rhetorically, but all right, you have on the left here, statins. They are uh, standard of care for cholesterol lowering. I'm sure everybody here knows somebody on statin medication. Uh, I think they're a trillion dollar drug in industry. And then on the right, we have milk's favorite cookie, the Oreo. And um, so, what if I told you I were to do an experiment where I compared these head to head for cholesterol lowering? In a particular context, though. And that's one of the big ideas that I want to hammer home in this little talk, is that when you have a biomarker, we've talked about a lot of biomarkers today, if you look at it like myopically, there's a lot of different reasons a given biomarker can change. We heard about RDW earlier. You can have like iron deficiency anemia can change your RDW. The other reasons maybe changes in you know, your stem cell population that would change that biomarker. Cholesterol is the same. It can go up for many different reasons. So you can have a genetic mutation in the cholesterol receptor, the LDL receptor. So you're not clearing a lot and your LDL particles will go up, your cholesterol will go up. That's a genetic condition, it's called familial hypercholesterolemia. Some people are more sensitive to saturated fat, so butter. People hear, you know, butter is gonna include, increase your cholesterol. Now, um, there might be different etiologies, different etiologies that people aren't aware of. So something we've been studying for a while is this phenomenon of lean mass hyperresponder, where particularly in the context of carbohydrate restriction, lean, generally fit, insulin-sensitive people have these skyrocketing cholesterol levels. And when I say skyrocketing, I literally mean I will rock, walk around like Harvard Medical School campus. If I tell my attending physicians the levels that we see, they think it's a joke or that I'm like misreading the labs. They don't believe it because it's equivalent to homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia in some cases. So a one in one million genetic disease that most physicians won't see in their lifetime. And the reason we think we see these levels is at a very high level um, in lean insulin sensitive people when you have a fuel shift from burning carbs to burning fat, say if you cut all, all carbohydrates from your diet, then you need to rely on fat energy as a fuel. And fat energy can be carried around the body by particles that contain cholesterol. So when you get say like a, a blood panel, it says your LDL cholesterol. So we'll go bad cholesterol. That's the cholesterol fraction in that group of particles. So this is where we get into a little bit of the biology, but again, this isn't really a talk about biology. This is the model we have for how this works. So basically, um, if you carbohydrate restrict, say you go on a ketogenic diet, the glycogen levels in your liver go low. And then a precursor to the LDL that you might measure on a panel is this VLDL. The VLDL gets shipped out, and they're basically carrying fat fuel which they use to replenish fat tissue, those are the little yellow blobs there, and fuel muscle. And basically this turnover process ends up generating high cholesterol as an epiphenomenon. I won't go into the details of it again because that's not really the point I want to make. But you end up with what appears to be, I mean almost you could say a paradox, is like this is what we see empirically, clinically, that if you take a population of people, um, and you put them on low carb diets, irrespective of even saturated fat intake, you would think, okay, if high cholesterol is quote bad, then it's the people that are less healthy that might have the quote bad response. But that's not what we see, it's the opposite of what we see. In, in fact, people with um, obesity, they, for example, class two obesity will tend to see a decrease in cholesterol, 
people with overweight or class one obesity won't see a change, and it's the lean insulin sensitive people in a dose dependent manner that see the increases in LDL, sometimes to astronomical levels. So on a mixed diet, if I'm eating just a regular diet, my LDL will be around 90. If I cut out carbohydrates, I can get to over 500. And again, pretty irrespective of um, my like saturated fat intake. And actually, we have a meta-analysis of RCTs, which I don't go into in here. But when you do the meta-analysis of 41 human randomized control trials, you see this pattern across those human randomized control trials. So the signal is there. Now, to demonstrate the principle, I think we all know here, like, if you have a model, this is our like, little bit of energy model if I go back, you want to try to break it, not try to confirm it. So what could I do that was like a bold test of this model that would also maybe catch some eyes and get a discussion started? Well, one thing you could say is if I just replace the glycogen source, then the flywheel should stop spinning and it should attenuate the cholesterol levels. So you could do that. Actually, we've done this with other carbohydrates more in swap manner. So sweet potatoes, blueberries, yada, yada, yada. Typically, that doesn't go to the headlines because it's not as sexy as a freaking Oreo cookie. So um, I designed this crossover trial, which is I get a strict diet lock-in, my baseline diet. Then for um, about two weeks, ended up being 16 days, I did a sleeve of Oreos on top of. It was a pure addition. I just added Oreos to my diet. Then I had a three-month washout, and then I went on high-intensity statin therapy for six weeks, um, which would be standard of care for that high-intensity uh, statin. It was Crestor or Rosuvastatin for uh, 20 mix. And based on our model, like if I'm addressing the root cause, we're talking about root cause physiology, then adding carbs, be it a sweet potato, this isn't a swap, so I'm not removing fat, actually I'm adding fat and saturated fat, because or even these have that, that should work to lower my cholesterol. The interesting question is, one, will it actually work? Because it's kind of a bold uh, experiment. And two, how does it compare to standard of care therapy with you know a drug that's part of a multi-billion or trillion dollar drug industry? And so here are the results, which was in one third the time frame, the Oreo cookies were two times as powerful as high intensity statin therapy which is a provocative finding. Now, and it's published, not funded, you have to look it up. Um, it, it, it achieved its ends. And so this is what I really want to talk about and what I would love questions on, of really forcing a conversation. Because I think to think about how we ask hard questions, stimulate debate, have you know dialogue about the things that we're each passionate about because we all have our passions like and how do we amplify that to what extent is there a role in our current era for let's call it legit debate or publicity stunts self experiments things like that i think for me as you know a young scientist finishing medical school thinking about like how i want to communicate to a broader audience it's a very interesting time be alive and engaging with this space because you have this inevitable clash between academia and social media and the media and this game you kind of have to play if you want to have a voice. So this was my first kind of like social experiment is if I do this, what spiral out, what spirals out of that? And I ended up going to conferences, talking, there was even, you know, clinical follow-up, positive clinical follow-up because physicians, cardiologists, um, you know, primary care practitioners who weren't aware of like, the 10 other papers we have on this topic then became aware of it and the underlying model because of this goofy stunt. And then they started implementing that with their patients, including those who were drug um, intolerant. So there were patients that like couldn't take statins for whatever reason or didn't want to. And now they're having better cholesterol reduction effects by virtue of me doing what seemed as a very goofy publicity stunt. And beyond that, I mean, some of the things I call this, I, I like to call it productive provocation. One, it increases awareness of pre-existing literature. So again, we have a meta-analysis of human randomized control trials that people weren't aware of. They're now aware of it, and it's clinical relevance because of a goofy stunt like this. It stimulates open-minded discussion. I am a very passionate and driven person. The flip side of that is I'm incredibly impatient. So when certain discussions weren't happening, I just decided, like, look, I want to force this discussion. And how am I going to do that? And this kind of experiment was um, one idea I had. 
research funded. It's like pretty crazy. I, there's a lot of projects I want to do in the metabolic health space. I'm 20 years old, the NIH isn't going to give me $10 million for these projects. You develop a presence and develop a voice that you can get funding through philanthropy. So I have one project now, it's going to be $1.9 million, and that money could be accessible to me by virtue of accessing different pools that have become accessible and arisen because of these sort of n equals one experiments. New partnerships, and honestly, it's just kind of fun. So, kind of like, <coughs> I, I present this as a social experiment because I think it's pretty implicit, the pros and cons that could come with communicating science in this sort of way. Um, and I try to do a pretty honest self audit of like what the real world impacts of these sort of things are. Because I can't say with confidence before I do this, this is just going to have net positive impact. I could never know that. And it's something that I put a lot of thought into before doing it. Nevertheless, I think it's a direction we will see things trending. I also sense a lot of enthusiasm for the whole idea of N equals one science and people engaging in the scientific process, applying it to their own life and their own health. So I think there's a broader discussion to be had here, but this I just found was a, this is my first foray into kind of an interesting case study in demonstrating science. And also I think there was some fun science behind it. So that I'll, I'll stop talking and see if there's any questions. Give it up for Nick Norris. Let's do some good questions. Who's first? We've got some good. David. Go ahead. Raise your hand. One of the uh, contentions in, in some of the publications around this uh, phenotype is wraps around the HDL LDL ratio. Um, in the last five to ten years, there's been increasing confidence about LDL, particularly ACOB, being predictive and a good surrogate for cardiovascular mortality, whereas GWAS studies and others have um, shown that H HDL is not necessarily confer protection. I wonder mm -hmm. um, if you have any plans in your work prospectively validating for the um, HDL, the LDL changes, whether those correlate in the hypothesized direction for us. Yeah. I think um, I have a two-part answer to that question. One is, so when we talk about ApoB particles, or you know LDL particles, they can have a causal relationship with ASCVD without that necessarily implying that there's an absolute, there's a high absolute risk in every individual. So a lot of the ideas of causality have been drawn out, for example, of Mendelian randomization studies, which are by their basis, based on like variation in the genetic pool. And so what we're seeing here is a metabolic response. So I think it's inappropriate to extrapolate from the Mendelian randomization trials something about the absolute risk associated with ApoB in a, Mendel a, a, a genetic response scenario. Um, in addition to that, the way I you know look at or think or want to think about these patterns. So in this lean mass hyperresponder pattern with high LDL, high HDL, and low triglycerides, I'm not of the opinion, and I, I see this misunderstanding a lot. Like Peter Atia will say, like, oh, people think that the you know low triglycerides and HDL are protective. I don't think that. I think that the pattern of metabolites that arises is a biological fingerprint of underlying physiology. So you see that the same with like metabolic vulnerability scores. We have a bunch of markers, and it's not that they have a direct causal relationship, but it's that their pattern tells you something about the underlying metabolic health, the physiology, which I think is more important. And in addition to that, um, I guess third part of my, my answer is with the LDL and the ApoB particles, um, just because there is a causal relationship does not tell you about like the slope of that relationship in different scenarios. And if you have different etiologies of arise, it would be inappropriate to expect the same risk preferred. So it's all well and dandy to say, oh, if I can snap my finger and change this singular biomarker, my risk for the singular outcome will be reduced. But then you'd say, well, how much is it reduced? And what are the real world costs? Because actual real life interventions, you know, change other variables. Um, so, you know, it's not something I would deal with flippantly. 
I mean, like, I'm not, I don't want to gamble on my own heart, for example. Like, this is literally my life on the line. But I think it's something we have to have new, more nuanced discussions about. And I will say we are doing prospective trials on Lima sniper responders. Actually, we have one paper under submission now, which does look at plaque progression and also the predictors of plaque progression in this population. And I'll say, because I don't think this is, I think I'm allowed to say this, there are some people in the lean mass hyperresponder population who do have plaque progression. The next question is though, is Apple B predicting progression at all in that population? And if not, what else is? And I'll kind of leave that as a cliffhanger because that paper is currently under submission. But thanks for the question. Thank you, and I'm glad that you're following up with prospective studies because I think we agree the, ju the jury's out we need to, in terms of the net effect, and it's exactly for people who are managing their own lipids. Uh, there are clear guidelines based on what we know right now, mm -hmm. but we need the prospective data based yes, on the hypothesis to determine the net effect. And I would never challenge those. I mean, I think, you know, the funny thing about these experiments is you're always going to come with someone that like layers on their perceptions. Like Nick's trying to change the guidelines with a goofy N equals one. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm trying to start a conversation that we need to have because I think that there is a myopic discussion around this and often a dismissive one. And I think something that, and forgive me for speaking out of turn as a medical student, but that some, some clinicians in, social, in the social media space don't fully appreciate is the dangers of a paternalistic approach in those spheres, because that degrades trust. And everybody might not have a medical or scientific background, but people can tell when you're condescending to them and that creates a rebellion, which is dangerous. Can I agree with you more? Thank you, Nick. Great. Thank you. Remind everybody again where they can find you? Um, any social media, Nick Norwitz, last name N O R W I T Z. I do not know any other Nick Norwitz on the planet, so I'm free.